Hello. And welcome to Moja Hack 2023 Reinforcement Learning Challenge. My name is Nicolas. And my name is Tristan. And we're going to uh, explain you how to solve a Rubik's Cube like this one using reinforcement learning. You know, Tristan, I never managed to solve this by, by myself. Uh, and I know you're good at this. You actually have a collection. Can you show it how it's Yeah, done? well, you're putting me a little bit on the spot, but let's have a go. Um, no pressure, no pressure. Yeah, no pressure, okay. <laughs> Uh, this is looking good. Um, yeah, I think that solves. Wow, that's excellent. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm, I bet that the machine can do it faster than you and more efficiently. Well, let's try. Yeah, we need the students <laughs> to actually call a reinforcement learning algorithm and make this happen. So, um, what we are proposing exactly, uh, uh, can you tell a bit more yeah. about it? So, I have implemented a version of uh, the Rubik's Cube uh, in Python, and I'm going to talk you through uh, how to interact with it, and then how to teach the machine to get better at solving the task. This is fantastic. And by the way, the starting point is going to the GitHub, that, which is available uh, in the Zindi Challenge, and uh, click on this opening collab if you want to use a uh, Google Collab or Chrome repository to get started with this Jupyter novel. You will see that at the beginning, there is just some imports and we are downloading the necessary uh, files to, to run the actual environment. But the interesting part uh, starts actually uh, after the imports, which uh, you're welcome to read more about it, which is actually how does a reinforcement learning loop works? Yeah, so at a very high level, we have an environment, which is represented in our case by this cube here. Um, and the agent uh, is responsible for selecting an action to perform. Uh, so that would be selecting a face to turn and how much to turn it. And when you do this, the environment state is going to update. So the configuration of the stickers on the cube is going to change. And the environment is also going to give you some feedback about whether the cube is solved or not, uh, represented as a number, one if it's solved, and zero if it's not solved. And your agent's goal is to maximize the total amount of reward that you get, which is to say to get the cube to solve as fast as possible. This is great. So you actually coded an environment which is a simulator of the Rubik's Cube for us. Yes. And your task is going to program the brain of the agent, right? Yes. So the agent is going to be given the state of a cube and it's going to be asked to select an action. And then the environment will take that action and turn the cube into a new cube. The agent will see that new cube and select a new action and so on until hopefully the cube is solved. This is fantastic. Let's get on to it. Yeah. So I'm going to demonstrate with regards to this actual physical cube just so that we can fully understand how everything is set up. So this is the uh, interface for defining the Rubik's Cube environment. There's some parameters that you can pass, in particular the number of scrambles that you perform every time the cube is given to you. In this example would be eight. Um, let's briefly talk about the observations that the agent is given. Uh, we have a helpful rendering down here so that we can see things in a little bit more detail. There are six faces on the cube, and we're going to call them uh, up, uh, front, so that would be uh, this one, uh, right, back, left, and lastly, the down face. And whenever you perform an action, that consists of specifying a face to move and an amount to move it by. Um, let's talk a little bit about the observations in more detail. So there are six, uh, which is represented here, number of faces, and each face has three rows and three columns. So when we want to address the first face, which would be this one, and then the, let's say, the first row, which is this one, and then the second column, so that would be this particular sticker here. Um, so that is basically how the observation looks. Um, let's do a simpler example when we don't actually scramble the cube so that it's a little bit simpler to think about. So this is what the cube looks like when it's first given to you with uh, zero scrambles. Um, if we specify an action to take, in this example we are taking the first face, which is the up face, and we are turning it by an amount which is clockwise. Uh, so the impact of that on the real cube is going to be like that. Um, and you can see that after performing this action, the status of the cube looks like this. So the up face has not changed. The front face now has this red band across the top. The right face has this blue band across the top, and so on. Uh, for more information about exactly how to map the cubies onto the uh, parts of the observation, I suggest you read the text up here. Excellent. And we are going to be using, for those who are familiar with, a gym environment, right? Yes. So everything conforms to the gym API, which means that there's an observation. And then when you pass in an action, uh, like so here, and you step the environment, you get back a new observation, a reward, uh, which is either one if the cube is solved or zero if the cube is not solved. 
uh, a done signal which indicates whether the episode has terminated, uh, which can happen either if you solve the cube or if you've run out of time. Uh, and there's some info which we actually don't end up using. This is fantastic, uh, Tristan. So uh, I think that what we can do now is go through a, a training utilizing the RLLib uh, library and, and see how this can happen. Sounds perfect. So I've implemented some training uh, example scripts. Uh, they are very able to be extended and I would strongly encourage you to experiment with different models or architectures that you think might be better suited to training. But I'll just talk you through the example here so that you can get an idea of like how to run your first example. Um, so to specify a model, um, this is the main function that we will use. If you want to look at the actual model architecture, then I suggest you consult the code to understand exactly how the model is set up. Um, but in this uh, main training script, you basically specify the difficulty of the environment you want, so the number of scrambles that you do on reset, in this example it's one, uh, and the number of iterations that you'd like to train for, so in this example it would be 10, uh, plus a bunch of other information that uh, we can talk about later. So the more you scramble uh, the cube, what happens with the actual training? So typically, if you scramble the cube more, it's going to be harder. So I would suggest when you first start training to only scramble the cube a fairly small number of times in order for you to be able to see progress. So in this example, whenever the cube is given to the agent, the cube is only going to have been turned once. And so the job of understanding which move was done and undoing it should be fairly simple for the agent to learn. So in 10 iterations, we would hope to be able to learn something. And if we scroll down here, we can basically see the progress. So uh, as the number of iterations goes up, you can see the uh, success rate for us being able to solve the cube, which starts out fairly low, uh, goes up higher and higher. So this is what successful training would look like. So what is actually the reward in this case? So the reward is one if the cube is solved and zero otherwise on every time step. It's a very sparse reward. Uh, it's possible to extend the definition of the reward function if you think that a better reward function would incentivize the agent to learn more. But in the final evaluation, the only goal is to solve the cube, not to uh, arrive at some good intermediate states. So uh, the final evaluation will be based off of the sparse reward function. Excellent. So now we have like a train checkpoint. What can we do after that? So there are a couple of things that you can do with it. The first one is that you can continue training. Uh, so this is what I want to show you here. Uh, the second model uh, takes as input the first model that we trained and continues training again. And you could do this for two reasons. One, because you uh, just wanted to train longer for some reason. Maybe your previous training crashed. But another thing that I would strongly encourage you to investigate the impact of is making the environment progressively harder. So when we trained here, we trained for 10 iterations with one scramble on reset. But here, we're going to start training with two scrambles on reset. So we're going to take what the an agent has already learned about being able to make undo one move. And now from that agent, we're going to try and see if it can undo two moves. Um, so that is uh, one of the main uh, approaches that I would recommend that you uh, investigate uh, in trying to solve this. And this is called curriculum learning. I guess we can also try to change the agent. Yes, you can, but the agent's uh, brain will have to be compatible between the old version that you're restoring from and the new version. So if you change the model, uh, it's going to be difficult to uh, port over the information that the agent has learned in the first phase of training to how the agent has learned in the subsequent phases of training. Great. A lot of parameters to play around with. Definitely. And once we are actually very happy with the checkpoint, how we can validate that we did well in the proposed challenge? So let's move on to evaluation. Uh, which is the next sec section here. So uh, if you want to step through things very manually, then I have set up some code here to do it, which will allow you to reset the environment and allow the agent to select a next action, uh, passing in the train checkpoint and explore exactly what action it's proposing in a different situation. But for the final evaluation, uh, the way that this is gonna work is that we're gonna provide you with a very large number of scrambled instances of cubes and we're going to ask the agent to automatically generate rollouts, which is to say complete sequences of actions and states of the cube that get you from the scramble at the start to the end state, which hopefully will be the solved state. Uh, so if we scroll down a little bit in this notebook, uh, this is an example of me running uh, the main rollout with a thousand seeds, uh, taking as input the train checkpoint that we made earlier and writing the results to a file. Uh, so this should take uh, a couple of minutes to run, and at the end of it, it will be a file which is going to be compatible with the validation script, which we'll talk about below. And very important, do not, do not change the seeds, because we are actually 
uh, evaluating it with, with these seeds. Is that correct? Yes. Well, so actually not all of these seeds, uh, but there's a private set of seeds that we will use for the final evaluation. However, if you want to get a preview into how your agent is likely doing, then I would suggest that you run the evaluation on the full set of seeds. It should again only take a couple of minutes. Uh, and at the end, you will get a score, which is based off of the proportion of the cubes that you solved correctly. However, there are actually three different levels of difficulty for the environment. One where the cube is only turned once, a second one where the cube is turned four times, and a final one where the cube is turned, I believe, ten times. Uh, and these are worth different amount of points. So you get one point for solving the easy instances, two points for solving the medium instances, and three points for solving the harder instances. So in this example, when I did the training only on very easy instances, if I scroll down to the end, you can see that my final score was about 19%. Um, I would hope to do better if I did more training. This is great. 19% is not too bad. Not too bad. I would do 0%. <laughs> um, uh, very important, guys. The last thing we want to show you is how to upload this to Cindy. So if on Google Colab you get uh, the, this uh, actual file generated, this uh, sample results.txt, yeah, uh, you will need to grab the file and download it. Okay, so this file here you download it into your local uh, machine, okay? And then once it's downloaded, you will take it and upload that result into the Cindy platform. We have uh, coded a server that is gonna evaluate that result and public the public score, and publish the public score so it's available for you to see. Of course, we also, as Tristan said, have the private score, which is the important one that you will be finally evaluated and we will be publishing these results by the end of the challenge. This is very exciting. I wish you good luck on the challenge and we will be around to answer any question you may have. And uh, Tristan will do also uh, some sort of uh, live session during the challenge. Good luck. Thanks guys. And if you manage this challenge, then maybe you can progress to the even harder challenge next time where we try and solve this guy or even this guy. Look at this. I mean, I'm scared just by seeing this. <laughs> How many cubes do you have? Uh, I have around 100 cubes. Uh, I didn't have time to code them all, but, but maybe in Emoja Hack 2024, we can get to that. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.